Hey, men church, your singing sounds awesome. Today we're going to begin a new series. In the past, we've uh, studied out uh, different uh, books in the Bible. Our last uh, series was on the book of Luke. But for the next three weeks, we're going to be focusing our attention to studying out the temple in the Old Testament. And uh, if the ushers could at this time, please be handing out the pamphlets. Now, for the next three Sundays, we'll be hitting these subjects. First of all, today we're going to talk about revolution and revelation through the temple. Next week, which is Easter, we're going to talk about celebration of the temple. And then the following week, sanctification of the temple. Now, let's be turning to 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy 3, which is written in about 66 AD, a few months before Paul passes from this world, we read these words of Paul to his son of the faith, Timothy, beginning in verse 14. But as for you, Timothy, continue what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those whom we've learned it. And now from infancy, you have known the holy scriptures, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God and the woman of God, amen, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, this is the first scripture that we study with individuals that really want to seek God. And yet, sometimes disciples don't even understand that the basic premise of this appeal to Paul is for Timothy to go by the scriptures. Now, the scriptures right here are the Old Testament scriptures. New Testament ones are just being written at this point. And he says these Old Testament scriptures are useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that we will become mature. Amen, church? See, we need to have a conviction that we're not just a New Testament church, but we're a Bible church. Yes, the Mosaic law has passed. We're not going to slay any lambs today. But bottom line, the teachings of the New Testament taken from the Old Testament are vital for our understanding of the Old Testament. You see, the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. So, for example, in the Old Testament, the people of God were in slavery in Egypt. They went through the Red Sea. They traveled in the desert for 40 years. Then they crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. As disciples, we understand that slavery in Egypt represents our old life. The Red Sea is baptism. Going through the desert is our Christian lives. Amen, guys. We can relate to that. Crossing the Jordan is death, and then promised land is, of course, heaven to be with God. So we understand the Old Testament physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritualities is something that is vital to be understood. Now, does everybody have a handout at this time? This is a cranky handout. You need to keep it for at least three weeks, okay, guys? Right there at the, at the front is just the beginning of the picture of Solomon's temple. If you just look at the side on the back, you'll see the side view of the temple. We'll talk more about that if you can see it right here. Now go to the section that says temple tour guide and then historical timeline and fascinating facts. And you will see four buildings. The first is a tabernacle. The second is Solomon's temple. The third is Zerubbabel's temple. And the last is Herod's temple. Now I want us to go briefly through this and then we'll get into the scriptures. First of all, we need to understand that the tabernacle is kind of the foreshadowing of the temple itself. The tabernacle was designed by God and given to Moses. So you can read all about this in Exodus chapters 25 
through 40. Talks about the initial sacrifice of the Israelites for the gold and the materials, and then the creation of the ark and the lampstand and all the different articles in the tabernacle, and finally just how to set up the tabernacle room by room. As you can see right here, the tabernacle was commissioned in about 1446 B.C., and lasts until the end of David's reign. Of course, the Lord put on David's heart to build the temple, but the Lord says, no, you can't build it. That's for your son Solomon to build the temple. And so we see right here that the temple is built in about 960 B.C. And of course, that is an incredible, incredible building. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Now, after the reign of Solomon, Israel divides. It's called Israel, the ten tribes of the north, and Judah, the one tribe which is also counted in there with Simeon, in the south. After a few hundred years, Israel, the northern tribe, is taken into captivity by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Now, as you see right here, the marker that we have is 586 B.C. is when the temple is plundered by the Babylonians, and in particular, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, an interesting marker that we have is, of course, Josiah's reign. He's the one under the kingship where they found the long-lost book of the law in the temple. That's how far away the Jews had gotten from the truth. He dies in 609 B.C. Interestingly enough, and you can check these scriptures on out, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, we come to understand that Nebuchadnezzar first came to Jerusalem in 606 B.C. and takes the first group of exiles. Numbered amongst those exiles was Daniel himself. And so 70 years later, it's 536 B.C. And why 70 years? Because Jeremiah prophesied that in 70 years, God would bring back the remnant from Babylon to Zion, Jerusalem, amen. And believe it or not, to the exact year, that's when King Cyrus rises to the throne and then sends the remnant on back and they begin to, quote, rebuild the temple and that's when they begin to build Zerubbabel's temple. Amen, guys? Now, interestingly enough, you see also in the blue right here, in 167, we see the temple's desecrated. Now, a lot of people with a Gentile background, that's most of us in the room, I think except for maybe Ken Zindler right here, I don't know. It's a very... Uh, well-known date amongst the Jewish community. And, of course, these would have been God's people at that particular time. That's the point in time that a man named Antiochus IV Epiphanes put into the temple a statue of Zeus. Famous story that goes with it is there's this woman, Hannah, that had seven sons. She was told to bow down to the statue of Zeus. She's Jewish and to worship it. She refuses, her sons refuse, and they're killed on the spot. A year later, a family rises up called the Maccabees. In particular, the one outstanding son was Judah of the five brothers. And he leads a Jewish revolt that throws off these Seleucid kings, frees up Israel, and then they begin to purify the temple once more. And you see that date is 164, B.C. Now, by the time they did it, things were so bad in Israel that they only had a little vial of oil left for the lamp in the temple of God. Only one day's worth. But miraculously, as the story goes, it lasted for eight days. And of course, that's enough time for the Jews to once more have the holy oil to put into the lamp of God. And that is the celebration of the Festival of Lights that we know as Hanukkah. That's where Hanukkah comes from, the Festival of Lights and the rededication of the temple under the Maccabees. Amen? Well, time goes forward, and we get to a little bit more familiar history for ourselves. In about 20 B.C., a man named Herod the Great, who's the king of of Judah and Israel at that particular time begins to work on what becomes known as Herod's temple. He looked at Zerubbabel's temple and it was just shabby. And he says, this needs to be glorious. So they quarry more stone, they enlarge the temple. I mean, they make it an incredible structure. Of course, it's during his reign that Jesus is born. And of course, we read about the Magi coming. 
and he finds out that a king has been born in Bethlehem, and he's the guy that kills all the babies there in Bethlehem. While Jesus and his family flees to Egypt, he dies shortly afterwards. Jesus' family come back to Nazareth, and you pretty much know the rest of the story, I hope. Amen, guys? Time passes on. The temple is finally finished. It takes years and years and years to build this thing, in about 64 B.C. But in 70, excuse me, 64 A.D., in 70 A.D., that's when Titus, the future Roman emperor, comes to Jerusalem and literally destroys the temple and the city and all of its one million people. That is the end of Judaism as we know it. And that's why the Bible says, in the last days, God says. It's the last days, not of time, but of the Jewish nation. Because God no longer had a physical nation. Now God had the spiritual nation of Israel, the church. Amen, guys? So I'll give you a little quick overview right here. There's some fun reading for the week. And remember to bring your pamphlet next week. Amen? Let's get into a little bit. Let's talk some more about the tabernacle. Let's get to the book of Exodus, chapter 24. <laughs> now, we're going to cover a lot of material today. Take notes. Go back and work it out because there's a lot of great meat here for us all. Remember now that Moses has led the people through the Red Sea. He's begun to lead them in the desert. And the Spirit leads Moses and God's people to Mount Sinai. And when he goes up on the mountain, we read this in verse 15 of chapter 24. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up onto the mountain. He stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Wow, this is the time that he receives the Ten Commandments. This is when he receives the testimonies of the laws of God. Now, if you were an Israelite, you weren't even allowed to get close to the mountain. As a matter of fact, if you touched it, you would die. And as they watched the cloud on Mount Sinai, it looked like there was a fire in the cloud. And Moses was up there for 40 days. And here are the things that were said. Chapter 25, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from me for each man whose heart prompts him to give. And he tells them what they give. And then verse, verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. Oh, wow. So the very first thing God commands Moses on the top of Mount Sinai, he says, you've got to get the people to bring a free will offering. They'll be bringing not only the gold to be able to pay for things, but also all the raw materials. He says, I want them to build a sanctuary where I'm going to dwell. Now, we understand that the tabernacle was just a tent. That's why it's called in many places in the Old Testament, the tent of meeting. It needed to be a tent because at this point, the Israelites are traveling all around the desert, right? Well, let's read on. What's he say next? Verse 10. Have them make a chest of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to the four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the side of the chest to carry it. The poles will remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark the testimony which I'll give to you. So... First of all, he tells Moses, listen, I want you to make me a sanctuary, the tent of meeting. Next thing, inside of the sanctuary, I want you to make me an ark. And of course, this is what the movie The Lost Ark is all about. It's made of wood, and then it's just covered with gold. And he says, to, what you need to do to place inside, you're going to put the Ten Commandments inside the ark so that you'll remember me. Now look what else is said right here. Verse 17, make an atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. And make two cherubim, those are angels, out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one of the cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubs of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. 
The cherubim are to face each other, looking towards the cover. Place the cover on the top of the ark and put the ark the te- put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all the commands for the Israelites. Wow, this is intense, guys. He says, make the tent of meeting. Then inside the tent of meeting, you make this ark. Inside the ark, you put in the Ten Commandments. Then make a cover, which is also called the mercy seat. You make a cover of gold, and you have two angels on this cover facing it with their wings up. And in between that space, right underneath the wings and the top of the mercy seat to cover, then I will meet with you and speak with you. Is that awesome or not? Now, go quickly on over to Hebrews chapter 9. Remember, the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. Now let's read Hebrews 9. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In the first room were the lampstand, the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the Covenant. Is that awesome or not? Now, look at your drawing right here. Though it's small, on the tabernacle part. If you look on the inside of the tent itself, you'll see a front room. That front room is called the holy place. The back room is called the most holy place, or some people call it the holy of holies. Now, we'll keep reading here. Hebrews 9, verse 6. When everything has been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room. So the daily, the priest would go into the holy place, but only the high priest, once a year, would go into the most holy place. So here it is, verse 7. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is the illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Now here it comes. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more, then, will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Does that fire you on up or not? You see, if you don't understand the Old Testament, there's no way you're really going to understand how awesome of a plan it is that Jesus Christ came to die for our sins. And once we've been washed with the blood of Jesus, now what is our life all about? Living to serve the living God. Are you with me here today? You know, I'm excited about the five people being baptized today. That's incredible. I'm particularly moved by uh, John and Sophia Aswood's decision. I mean, it's such an awesome thing when you're married and some of all the craziness of the world, and then you get the chance to confess Jesus as Lord and to be baptized, immersed in water, to have all your sins forgiven, and then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and start fresh again. That's the promise for anybody that responds to the sacrifice of Jesus. Now, let's keep moving right here. We understand the tabernacle. Now, when the temple is built, 
It has the same floor plan as the tabernacle. You have the outer room, the holy place, and you have the back room, the most holy place, the holy of holies. But now, let's go see what the temple was all about. Turn to Second Chronicles chapter 3. We're going to pull all these strings together at the end. You'll see where we're going. Verse 1. Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Aaron the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Wow, do you remember that story in 2 Samuel chapter 24? After David had sinfully counted Israel... And the angel of the Lord had wiped out 70,000 people, and David wants to stop the plague. And so he goes to Aaron of the Jebusite's house, and he says, I've got to offer a sacrifice. Aaron says, hold it, I'll give you everything you need. And David says, how can I offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing? And at that point, he offers a sacrifice, and the plague stops. That's right there on Mount Moriah. But here's the coolest thing. If you turn to Genesis chapter 22, you'll find that it's on Mount Moriah, that Abraham sacrifices Isaac. That's the very beginning where God foreshadowed Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of his one and only son. Is that pretty cool? All on Mount Moriah. Well, now, what was the, the temple all about? Well, let's look at it. Verse 3. The foundation Solomon laid for the temple, the temple of God, was 60 cubits long and 20 cubits wide. That's about 90 feet by 30 feet. It's not huge. Middle of verse 4. He overlaid the inside with pure gold. Can you imagine that? The whole inside of the temple is pure gold. He paneled the main hall with pine and covered it with fine gold and decorated it with palm tree and chains design. He adorned the temple with precious stones and the gold used was the gold of Pavaram. He overlaid the ceiling beams, door frames, walls, and the doors of the temple with gold and he carved cherubim on the wall. He built the most holy place, its length corresponding to the width of the temple, 20 cubits long and 20 cubits wide. He overlaid the inside with 600 talents of fine gold. That's incredible. That's 23 tons of gold. Now, look at your, look at your drawing right here. Look at the front part right here. This is a side view of Solomon's temple. You see on the outside the altar? You see... The pool right here. You see the twin pillars. And then you enter the holy place. I mean, you, basically, this building has been baptized in gold. Then you enter the holy of holies, this small room in the back. You see the cherubim right there. And then the very back room, that's the, the treasure house of the Lord, where all the treasures of God's people are kept. Pretty awesome, huh? <clears throat> well... We find that this was a grand building that people, even the Queen of Sheba, came all the way from Ethiopia just to witness the temple of God. But what happened? Well, let's turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. This beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building, what happened? Verse 15. The year now is 586 B.C. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through the messengers again and again because he had pity on his people in his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was roused against his people and there was no remedy. He's saying right here, God could not fix up his people. There was no remedy for the spiritual sickness that Israel had. Verse 17. He brought up against the king, he brought up against them the king of Babylonians, who killed their young men with the sword in the sanctuary and spared neither young man nor young woman, old men nor aged. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasure of the Lord's temple and the treasure of the kings and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile the remnant who escaped the sword. And they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. 
The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the time of desolation and rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word the Lord had spoken to Jeremiah. You see, we need to understand, the temple was the dwelling of God. And the Israelites gloried in the temple saying, hey, we're the people of God. But their lives were so far away from living by the word of God, God says, listen, I am no longer with you. And to show that, I'm bringing Nebuchadnezzar against you. He's got to not only destroy Jerusalem, but he is going to destroy the temple to show that I am not with you. I will take you then into Babylon for 70 years. That's the prophecy of Jeremiah, right? And remember that, that exile really starts in 606 B.C. And it says, after 70 years, I'll bring you back. And that's exactly what the last part of Second Chronicles 36 talks about. Is that the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus to bring back a remnant. Amen? That's the same thing it says in the first part of Ezra, the next page on over. And so, when the people began to go back, they began to rebuild the foundation. Look at chapter 3 of Ezra. So the first thing to do is go lay the foundation. Verse 10, chapter 3. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with their trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He's good. His love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. What incredible mixed reaction right here. The year now is in the late 20s, 520s B.C., the Israelites have come, they've sacrificed, and they've laid the foundation, the exact same foundation as the old temple, Solomon's temple. Except in building this, they were a poor remnant. And so the rocks were roughly hewed on out. There was nothing glorious. There was nothing beautiful about the beginning of this second temple. As a matter of fact, all the old people, they were crying because they remembered Solomon's temple, that temple that was baptized in gold. You remember that? But all the young people, they were fired up because God was with them again. Now Haggai talks about it. He's the prophet. There's some persecution that stops the building of the temple. Go to the book of Haggai now. In Haggai chapter 2, after the vicious persecution against the Jews... Haggai gets them building again. In chapter 2, verse 3, we read, he's talking to the Jews. Who of you is left that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem like nothing? Wow. But now be strong. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry lands. I will shake all the nations. The desire of all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, declares the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace declares the Lord Almighty. What's Haggai say right here? He says, okay, outwardly it doesn't look like much because we're a poor people now. He says, but you need to understand that now God is with us. And if God wanted to, I mean, he is the God of all the gold in the world, all the silver, he could give us more money, but that's not what God wants. God wants us to understand that he is with us. And then he gives them a promise. He says, bottom line, the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Why? This is a prophecy of Christianity. The Jewish nation was the former house and of course the Christian spiritual Israel 
would be the present house. You know, I can't help but think about so many parallels that run between the old movement that so many of us were a part of us and the new movement right now. I can remember a time back in the early 90s, I sat down with a couple that just come on into an incredible inheritance. And they wanted to meet with Elena and myself, and they wanted to share with us how much money they had decided to give to the church. And they said, we want to give $2 million. I go, wow, amen, come on. I don't know how many times you've been offered $2 million, but that's, that's a, that was a cranking conversation right there. You know, this particular missions contribution, no one's come to Elena and me and offered $2 million. But you know, I see the hearts of the people. I think about Kevin Lynn, who was just coming on over here to visit Burgundy three weeks ago for Women's Day. And then she stayed three weeks and got restored in the Lord. Didn't have hardly any money, but you know something? She left $500 for the missions contribution. I think about the little remnant group up in San Francisco. There are six disciples up there and two wannabe disciples. I mean, they want to get baptized. I mean, they have sold everything that's precious to them. Our our new sister Maria, she has this kind of Disney snow globe set, you know. And to her, they're worth a lot. She's been selling those. Her husband, Chris, who's not a Christian, he has all these famous football jerseys. And he's been selling those. That little group of disciples has sent us $5,000 $5,000 from the mission's contribution. Now maybe, maybe that's not $2 million, but let me tell you something. With hearts like that, we cannot be stopped. Are you with me right here, church? See, we got to get a conviction that what God is doing now is incredible. Why? God is with us. Amen? You know, when you come to Herod's temple, we'll talk a little bit about that more next week on Easter Sunday. But bottom line, we need to understand that by A.D. 70, the prophecy of Jesus had come true. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, where it says, After this gospel, the kingdom has been preached to all nations. Then the end will come. And the end he talks about is the end of the Jewish nation, the physical Jewish nation, and the Mosaic law being practiced. And so by 70 A.D., Jesus prophesied that the world would be evangelized. Amen, guys? Well, let's get into these revolutionary revelations. Remember, the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the New Testament spiritual realities. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We read this in verse 18. <clears throat> Flee from sexual immorality. All those sins a man commits are outside of his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you received from God? You are not your own. You were brought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Number one. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, we understand that now. That means that that God is with us. God's Spirit's with us. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God was only with the leaders, like with Moses and with David and with the prophets. Now the promise is, is that God's Spirit will be with anybody who makes the decision to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and be baptized for remission of sins. Is that awesome or not? So how do we treat our bodies then? Well, no more immorality. No more pornography. No more smoking. No more drugs. That settles it. This is the temple of the living God. How can I desecrate it? I've got to live a life that honors God with my body. Amen, church? You know, uh, a brother that's really inspired me for the past few weeks, has has been Hudson Wilson. And for those that don't know Hudson, Hudson is a young man that was, quote, raised in the church. He was raised going to church and everything with his dad and mom. And like, quote, many kids raised in the church, he got baptized at the age you're supposed to get baptized at. 
You know, the parents are expecting you to do it. Everybody in the team ministry is doing it. It's just time for you to get baptized. <laughs> he got baptized a few years ago. But he came here at the invitation of Vic Jr. to get strong spiritually. After Vic got in there with the word of God, Hudson came to say, you know something? I never really made the decision to be a baptized disciple. You know, some people get all confused about rebaptism. No such thing as rebaptism. You only get baptized once. But it's got to be right. If you didn't get baptized right, then you weren't baptized. You know what I mean right here, guys? And Vic called out from the scriptures. Said, you, he says, Hudson, you've got to deal with your heart. And Hudson knew one of the things that hardened his heart for years. Even though he had a, a great mom and dad that really tried to lead him to the truth, Larry and Christy Wilson, Christy's not his real mom. And his real mom had hurt Hudson and the family very, very badly with some very bad sins. And because she'd hurt the family so much, and Hudson in particular, five years ago, he just stopped talking to her altogether. He was so mad, so bitter, so upset, he wanted nothing to do with her. And Victor said, hey, if you're going to be a disciple of Christ, if the Holy Spirit is going to be able to live inside of you, then you got to deal with your bitterness. That doesn't mean you smooth it over. It does mean that you reach out to your real mom in love because she needs to become a disciple too. In response to that, he repented. He called up his real mom. She was so moved that Hudson had reestablished a relationship with her. And Hudson, having broken down that barrier of bitterness, then got baptized to become a true disciple of Jesus Christ. Are you with me right here? See, guys, we need to understand. If you're an individual that was baptized as a baby, or maybe you were a baptized adult, but you never became a disciple, let me tell you something. You've not really been baptized. And you need to get serious because it's the most serious thing in the world for God's spirit to come and live inside of your heart. Because it says, God is with you. And light can have no fellowship with the darkness. Are you with me right here, guys? Let's move on to our second revolutionary revelation. Turn to John chapter 3. Back it up to John 2. Many individuals, when they read the Bible, they're thrown off by the fact that the Jewish writers don't write everything in chronological order. That's just a Western thought that we have. So when we see the clearing of the temple in John 2, that, that wasn't at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. It was at the end of the ministry. But it's written in a way that presents the gospel in John's mind the best. So right here, Jesus clears the temple. And then we read in verse 18 these words. <clears throat> then the Jews demanded of Jesus, What miraculous kind can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus asked them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken about was his body. After he was raised from dead, his disciples recalled what had been said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, our second revolutionary revelation is that Jesus' body is the temple of God. And right here, he was talking about Herod's temple. He says, you tear down this beautiful temple that was still in the process of being built. He says, you tear it down. And in three days' time, I will build it back. And of course, he was talking about his resurrection. And of course, that is what separates Christianity from, quote, all other religions. Amen? We believe Jesus rose from the dead. Are you with me here, church? And you'll hear a lot more about that on Easter Sunday, next Sunday. Amen? Let's get to our last point right now. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3.
Paul writes here in verse 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred and you are that temple. Well, right here, he's not talking about someone's physical body. Right here he's saying the church, the body of Christ, the family of God, is also the temple of God. Now, look over to Ephesians 2 in a scripture that we teach everybody that wants to become a disciple. See if this has a little bit greater impact on you now. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Is that awesome or not? See, God's church is God's temple. That's where God lives. That's what makes the church so awesome. That's what makes it so amazing. Now let's look at one more scripture to help us understand what going to church is all about. Turn to Hebrews Chapter 12. You know, it's interesting there in Ephesians 2, he talks about laying the foundation. Christ is a cornerstone, and all of us disciples, we are the temple of God. And collectively speaking, this is where the Spirit of God dwells. Now, the writer of the Hebrews says a little bit different, but equally powerfully. In Hebrews 12, verse 18, see if you recognize some of the Old Testament foreshadowing. In verse 18, he says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. Okay, and what's he talking about right here? Mount Sinai, right? He says, You've not come to that kind of a mountain of darkness, gloom, and storm to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who were to beg that no further word be spoken to them because they couldn't bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. Now, if Moses is afraid, that's a cranking sight, guys. Now, look at this. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. Is that fire you on up or not? Verse 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken... Let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You see, he says, you're on Mount Zion. Not physical Mount Moriah, but spiritual Mount Zion. And on Mount Zion, there thousands upon thousands of angels are there in joyful assembly. And that's true here this morning. Amen, guys? There is a celebration because God is with us. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, so I will be with them. How should our hearts be when we come to church? It's not just some little club we're coming to. We are coming to be with disciples of Jesus Christ. We are coming to be with the angels of God. We are coming to worship our God. How? With reverence and with fear. It is an incredible thing to come to church. And you don't blow that on off. The kingdom of God is special. God's been planning it before time itself. He tried to get us to understand how special this was by giving us the Old Testament. And he foreshadowed the temple of God, the church of God, where his spirit would live. And where his spirit would guide us. And his spirit would speak to us. Is that encourage you or not? Now we need to understand... That biblically speaking, all the disciples around the world, no matter what fellowship they're in, make up what's called the church universal. But there's no individual or group of people that, so to speak, have any kind of authority to guide everybody. So in our day and age, all we can do is to work with what's called the visible church. That's, that's us. Amen, guys? In other words, we see each other. It's visible. <laughs> Only God can look down from heaven and see all the true disciples everywhere, see? And so in building God's church, we need to understand that all we can do is to work with 
the visible church. So, what is our heart? Well, first of all, we're working with the local congregation right here. And it's exciting what God is doing. I mean, we're starting to see now the region starting to multiply. We're seeing people from the Latin region baptized. The West, AMS, the East, all, all those regions are being fruitful today. And you know something? It's going to be more and more baptisms as we add more and more regions to our fellowship. I mean, this summer, preferably, we're going to get a region down in San Diego. Uh, this summer, when Patterson and Ten come on over from Phoenix, we're going to get a region in Long Beach right there. And the multiplication of disciples will increase. Now, one of the things that we've seen in our local congregation is that there have been two groups that have been neglected in our congregation. One of them is the singles, and the other is the teens. And so, in building the temple of God, we want to make sure that the Spirit of God is even in the singles. That the Spirit of God is, yes, in the teens as well. Amen. And so, now that Michael and Michelle are full-time in the Lord, they are going to spearhead the singles' work. <clears throat> and really, it takes someone full-time to oversee a fellowship like that. The same thing is true with the teens. We've just not had the full-time people. But we've asked Victor Gonzalez Jr. and Aurora to take over the ministry of the teens. They'll continue to lead UCLA. But they will build up the teens, and we will have a cranking fellowship. Amen, guys? And God is going to move here locally. But you know something? We're supposed to be building God's temple, not just in a local sense, but worldwide, right? I mean, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, he says, go and make disciples what? Of all nations. In Mark chapter 16, he said, go into what? All the world. You didn't know that one as well. Amen. You got to work on that one. But my favorite is in the book of Mark, right after Jesus clears the temple. He says in Mark 11, verse 17, My house, talking about the temple, but talking about the spiritual temple to be, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. See, Jesus' vision was that the temple would be a fit, spiritual temple be a house of prayer. They'd talk to God. A relationship with God would join them together. Amen? And it would be for all nations. Make no mistake about it. The true disciple has a vision that the nations will be evangelized in this generation. Amen, guys? Right now, as a movement, as God's new movement, there's a two-fold plan to evangelize the nations in the generation. First of all, we're trying to get to as many U.S. cities as possible. Why? Because we want to build dynamic churches here in the first world that will supply us, A, with a lot of money to go foreign. Amen, guys? And secondly, with a lot of young people to go on mission teams. That's why we've got to have a cranking campus and teen ministry. Amen? The second challenge is to go to the key nations of the world. I mean, think about this. I believe with all of my heart that all you need to evangelize a city, whether it be of 500,000, or Eugene, or a city of 20 million like LA, all you need is to have a pure group of disciples who are totally sold out to God. And that small group of disciples will make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, and that city will be evangelized. Amen, guys? I not only believe that, I believe if you keep a group of disciples pure and you go to the capital city of a nation, that capital city can not only be evangelized, but then that capital city church can send out church plantings to all the other key cities in that nation. And that nation can be evangelized in this generation. But here's the key thing. I believe there are 10 to 12 key cities outside the United States that if we can put Groups of sold-out disciples, and, and we keep them pure. Are you talking, you understand what I'm saying right here? To stay pure in their sold-out commitment. Then they can not only evangelize that city, but then they can send mission teams to the surrounding capital cities of those nations, who then can evangelize that nation. What are some of these cities? Let me just say them. Santiago, Chile, for South America. London, England, Paris. Moscow, Johannesburg, 
Chennai, India, Hong Kong, Sydney, Australia, Mexico City, Sao Paulo. We get churches into those places. Not only are we going to blow it out here in the United States, but we'll evangelize the world. How close are we? Well, we have a cranking church right now in Santiago, Chile. Thanks to Raul and Linda and, of course, the Sullivans down there. And the mission's contribution today is going to support the Sullivans. Amen? We're also sending Javier Ochoa down there to be a full-time intern in June. Get this. There are remnant groups in already over half these places. In London, in India, there, there are now six churches in India. In Sydney, Australia, just a little bit north in Brisbane, we have a remnant group. And we have a new remnant group that came out last week in Mexico. Is that far you on up in Monterrey? Now here's the thing. Today, there's another group coming out in Manila, Philippines, and in Moscow, Russia. Now that is that far you on up or not. And you know something? The temple may look a little bit rugged on the outside. <laughs> We're not the richest group of people. You know what I'm talking about right here? But you know, like the Temple of Solomon, every disciple is gold. That's how they're viewed in the eyes of God. Church, get to know your Old Testament. Come to understand the temple of God and God's planning for this very hour so that we could build his temple, not just some local autonomous little temple, no. but to have a temple that would complete Jesus' vision to be a house of prayer for all nations in this generation. And may God bless all of our efforts. Wow.